I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Arawana Hayashi. Arawana's pioneering work as a choreographer, performer, and educator is deeply sourced in collaborative improvisation. She currently heads the creation of Social Presencing Theater for the Presencing Institute. Working with Otto Scharmer and colleagues at the Presencing Institute, she brings her background in the arts, meditation, and social justice to creating social presencing that makes visible both current reality and emerging future possibilities. Welcome, Arawana. It's wonderful to be here. Great to see you. Great to see you. So in this modern age, so many of us have an allegiance to the mind, and somehow you have an allegiance to the body. So much of your work is that. Um, and so how did that come to be? What first inspired you to, to begin dancing and doing work related to the body? Hmm. So um, I guess I would need to think back for many, many years because um, I was uh, trained, actually, uh, as a child and a young adult um, in, in dance, in Western dance, first ballet and then contemporary dance. Um, it's hard to know if you grow up in rural Ohio why your um, why your parents uh, um, kind of respond. It must have been a response to something that I, as a five-year-old, really wanted to do. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to have parents that, um, that said, sure, we can um, go to dance lessons. And it might have been just that they wanted a more graceful uh, child, uh, it might have been just what they thought would be uh, the way people did things. I'm not quite sure. But it started um, my life as a dancer. And my um, when I think about it, a lot of it had to do with um, really a kind of mindfulness, like how to pay attention to um, some moment of experience that was simplified down to, um, you know, a still shape or a, something moving. It simplified down into um, the body um, in space. And if all these decades later, um, much of the work is the same, um, more... Uh, like improvised or more spontaneous, let's say, but nonetheless in the same um, way of attending to the voice or the body, which is feeling, and the sense of space and possibility and openness and um, kind of moving. Uh, maybe a kind of experience of freedom in some way. I love that. Thank you. And I think that's a really good moment to move into something you've been doing a lot of lately, which is your social presencing theater. I mean, you're all over the world this year. And in this work, from my understanding, you're offering a path to explore humans with other humans and with our greater body of existence. And it includes a combination of being in the present body and also turning towards what feels challenging and listening rather than rejecting. And I'm curious about that because I think as humans, you know, our limbic brain and just naturally we want to run away from anything that might at all be something we deem not good. And I'm curious how this work in particular helps us open and be interested in the complexity of of either ourselves as an individual or for an organization in, in that space. Mm. So um, my life is very much shaped and the work is very much shaped by um, my own practice in Shambhala and my own uh, training with Trungpa Rinpoche and his interest in art and the power of art to um, transform 
um, or let's say to recognize sanity and beauty and healthiness in ourselves as individuals and in um, social systems, family, teams, organizations, society itself. And so part of the training um, as an artist is to really, in, in this um, way of uh, thinking, is to really uh, trust in one's sense perceptions, that there's a sense of um, directness in um, how and what in, in, in the process of seeing or hearing or feeling, sensing, that is trustworthy. So um, that is, that's my background and, and bringing that to choreography and to uh, also formal work in, in Japanese uh, traditional dance, court dance. Um, and um, it had to do again with what it, what, how we could experience the basic goodness of, of every moment. And so when I met, so I met Otto Scharmer in maybe 2003 or something like that, and Otto Scharmer is, um, articulates a change theory called Theory U, built upon uh, systems thinking. And so I was able to bring this art form of, of movement with um, his theory of um, applying uh, the qualities of an open mind and an open heart and open will to um, transforming um, and uh, engaging in some of the uh, the most kind of intractable kind of or, uh, problems or uh, obstacles uh, challenges that we feel on the planet whether that was uh, around ecological um, degradation or social, you know, grotesque social um, inequality or spiritual um, disconnect and despair and all of the, the symptoms of depression and anxiety disorder. So um, the social presencing theater was born out of that kind of marriage, let's say, between the sort of Shambhala art and the teachings that Otto was offering on uh, systems change. And so one of the, you know, one of the curiosities and one of the uh, longings that we all have is finding the sort of health and goodness in our systems. And there's such a tendency for all of us, certainly myself and many of us, to notice the the problems, notice that it's dysfunctional, notice this word that's so popular now called toxic uh, qualities of um, relationships and systems and um, feel the pain and the suffering that's going on in the world as a result of these un unhealthy and um, uh, kind of just crazy and disconnected uh, situations. So there's something about the, the feeling of the discomfort and the longing to, 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 to be able to manifest personally and socially a, a better society um, is, is kind of at the root of the work. So one of the issues around social presence in theater that has developed has been this um, way of working with what we call our stucks people really uh, don't like this word, but I'm just, I haven't been able to come up with anything better. You know, in, in a creative process, there are things that sometimes don't go forward. They don't work out. There are challenges, there are obstacles. And somehow this is part of a creative or innovation process. To, to think that that's not part of the process seems um, out of touch, at least in terms of my own experience. So, um, but these, of course, can be incredibly painful and incredibly complex. So to some extent, we're developing a, a habit to, as you say, to not 
turn away from, to not deny, to not, um, sometimes it's called spiritual or psychologically bypassing um, what actually needs our attention. So part of using our body and using this method of social presencing theater, we're using the word theater as something that is visible. That's the root of the word theater, a place where something significant can be seen, is visible. And the body is seen. And groups of bodies together, this is visible to everybody, the choices people make. And so um, we're saying that the mind, conceptual, intellectual mind, is very important, of course, as, and that emotional intelligence is very important in terms of all of our living together well on the planet. But also the body knows a lot. The, there's body intelligence. The body and the sense perceptions, they know things and they can have a per, perspective that maybe we can't access intellectually. So we could turn our toward, let's say, our kind of stuck place at the moment. We, we, we identify, oh yeah, this is a, what I could, I'm going to call for today a stuck place in my current situation. It could be a relationship, it could be an attitude, it could be um, something about a project that's not going forward. So the practice is that we turn toward it and we embody, like, what does it feel like? Not acting it out like charades or something, but what if, if I could put my body in a shape that would, that would um, really embody the feeling of the stuck, not the story, but just the feeling, the quality of it, um, then listen into the body and allow the body to move where it wants to go. Because basically stuck is not a sustainable situation. Like everything is moving and changing and growing. And all of us are moving and changing and growing, even if we think we're stuck. Um, if we actually turn toward and embody the stuck, then we allow the body to, to start to go toward what it, it wants to do. Not what we want to do, but what the, the body wants to do in terms of moving from the stuck place. And then we stop and we reflect on that. Well, what happened there? Like what, what's the difference between where we began and where a few moments later we might end? Uh, what, what was surprising about that? Or where in the body did it move? Did the eyes move first? Did the feet move first? So we're using our body as a kind of lab <laughs> to see what naturally natural kind of healthiness and sanity is living in the body that has a voice and wants to express itself in a certain way. And that can be applied to teams and it can be applied to um, a way of looking at larger systems, education, healthcare, things like that. So on the, on the ground, if you were to use that kind of activity in an organization, mm -hmm. how would that look in terms of if they were stuck trying to sort something out? Well, in, in a simple way, you could just, um, ask people to embody the sense of that and then move by paying attention using a little bit of mindfulness body and a little bit of awareness of the space, their relationships, whether they're closer or further from one another, whether they're on the edge of the space, whether they're in the center of the space, whether they're standing taller and some are sitting or lying down. <laughs> I know it, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to describe. I know that, but yeah. if you were to see seven or eight people, and maybe each of them embodies an aspect of their stuck situation, <laughs> and you ask them to not think so much about this, not just download their concept of what they think a solution would be. Don't even think about a solution. It isn't a problem-solution method. It's a method for which you could embody in a social sculpture, that's what we call that, a social sculpture, your current reality, your current situation. 
and, and you know it's it's abstracted let's say it's not you're not acting it out like a skit or something like that it's it's it just by placement in the space and a shape you set up a social sculpture that would embody your current whatever your current situation is and in this case let's say there's something that's kind of stuck and not moving there you ask the seven people who are, who are embodying these different it could be stakeholders in a system or aspects of a situation just based on what the body feels like doing and the social body like together the seven of them make a kind of social body they make their own kind of being which is the so, the social body being and the being doesn't want to be stuck. That's a hypothesis. But there is a longing for their team or their organization to be, to, be, to be moving forward from this situation. So by paying attention to the body feeling and the awareness of the space and where they are in the space, they move around a little bit, just for a few minutes, right? And then they, they stop in their second sculpture. And then each of them might say something, like a voice, not really about them, but about if, if that shape in that part of the space could speak, what would it say? What would that part of the system have to say? Each one speaks. And then basically we just have a little dialogue about, well, what did we notice? What did we hear? What surprised us? Um, you know, where was there a shift? And how were we paying attention? Was it just sort of ego-oriented and very withdrawn? Or was it, did our attention include one other person? Or were we actually able to pay attention to the well-being of the whole? Mm -hmm. So we, we have that, com that conversation, and it's really just a way of reflecting on uh, a shared visibility, that we see something together, and we, we feel something together. And yet we each have our unique um, role and perspective. So how do, we, uh, how do we hear that in a way that um, allows us to step forward? Mm. So we could just say it's another way of listening and uh, oftentimes can bring insights and wisdom that we're not able to access with more talking and more thinking about it. <laughs> that's really helpful and i'm sure it's hard to to say in words it's much yeah <laughs> you i have no that. idea if a listener has any idea really what, me, what? So I imagine it would help a li listener also really reframing it so it's not a problem solution yeah and then the, and, and also then allows the conversation maybe to to be more in the arena of of uh creativity or fresh ideas or you know just new new ways of of experiencing that are inclusive and intelligent, yeah. So in the world of activism, I know I've personally struggled with this and I'm mm -hmm. curious your thoughts of how we can be active in the world but not have a widening gap between good and evil. How can we create more unity rather than division and more love obviously rather than hatred and it's a big question, but I'm curious like, what we can even do within our own minds and, and bodies as individuals in the realm of activism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, I wish I, I wish I knew way more about this topic than I do to begin with. I, I feel that there's so much all of us need to learn about uh, how to bring, how, let's just say, those of us in meditation communities meditation practitioners, how we bring our view and practice into the fractured and divisive and in a way very powerful in some way difficulties and differences that we have. You know, I think in, in our Shambhala teachings, we, we talk about the basis of, of, of every conversation and every engagement is this a gentleness and kind of humbleness and a quality of, if we use a Zen, <laughs> the Zen expression, a beginner's mind, that entering every conversation and every challenge with 
um, big ears, you know, with <laughs> the tiger's ears of him being up and listening to what's happening, you know, in a gentle way. Um, and, and allowing for that kind of spaciousness around what we say and what we hear. And then the second half of that is this is the strength and the courage to, um, and the faith, let's say, necessary to hold with this some kind of quality of the goodness of the person, no matter what they think, no matter what their view is, no matter how much aggression or confusion any of us bring, that underneath it all is, is humanity, is a humanness that, um, that can connect and can love and is kind and brave and, and intelligent. But it's um, that combination of a kind of gentleness and courage we could say gentleness and fearlessness is, is those are capacities that we can all, <laughs> I think probably all of us, certainly for, speaking for myself, my life is about cultivating these capacities to be both gentle and, and really fearless in terms of uh, not giving up on on any human being or any situation or any situation that's going on on the planet now. Um, that's a kind of I feel like it's an unsatisfactory and abstract answer. Or, but uh, you know, activism is an art form, I think, and a practice that we all in, in this day and age we all need to engage in. I mean, we, none of us, we, we, and many of us are just way too privileged to, to flop down and say, you know, I, I, I'm overwhelmed or I, uh, I don't know how to do this. And we, we say that, but we're too privileged to say that, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's a learning and we need to learn from each other. I mean, we need to just engage and make mistakes and get feedback and get in the conversation, I think, and pay attention to the body so we don't get disconnected into sort of mental, intellectual, you know, political ideology, but stay in the heart and stay in the body. In gratitude to our listeners and to support the making of this podcast, we want to let you know that you receive 10% off our shop of online courses and botanical delights, including tonics, teas, and beauty care. Visit oliviaclementine.com and at checkout enter the code LOVE and LIBERATION for the discount. I am a big fan of your traditional court dancing, your bugaku dance, and I've seen you do it a few times, and um, my understanding, maybe I read it on your website or something like this, or maybe you've told me or something, but is that you're one of the few people outside of Japan that um, does this dance? Is this mm. Probably. It's not. Uh, it's seventh century uh, Japanese court dance, not exactly on the cutting edge of anything. <laughs> and it was something that my own teacher, Trum Rinpoche, knew something about and asked me to just to see what that was about or to study he was very um he was very interested in people's ethnicity and how people did or didn't keep connected to their cultural and family roots mm. and i think that was one of the reasons um, why he thought this might be interesting and for me, it, a lot of it of, of training has to do with the teacher. And I had an amazing teacher who was at uh, University of California in Los Angeles from Tokyo, from the Imperial Household Music Department. So partially it was my attraction to the music, which is so beautiful, gagaku, to the dance form and to the teacher. And... Um, so it is the opposite of improvisation. It's been the same way, more or less, 
for thousands of years. <laughs> uh, well, and um, so the the it was made to bring more gods, more kami into the world. It was made as a kind of ceremony for joining the earth and the ancestors with the gods and with nature. Um, it, it had a purpose, as it were, that music and dance had a purpose of bringing harmony and balance and beauty into the world. And it had to do with a kind of, um, maybe the word would be something like perfection, that doing it well and completely had in my experience and in seeing it as well, um, a kind of sense of wholeness or it's not exactly connection, like a kind of sense that nature and gods and people and ancestors and music and gesture, it, it all it hung together as, a, as one experience that didn't, wasn't bound by time or culture or all, all the many things that bind us. So for me, this was a, a very important part of my life. Um, we had a troop of people in the U.S. and Canada that got together and practiced when, during the lifetime of my teacher. And then when he passed away, it's been very difficult to, for us to find in our <laughs> busy lives and schedules to practice in a, in a serious way. Uh, but the love of the form is there, and I would love to do it more than I do. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm... I'm, I'm I, I very pretty much appreciate that you're, you've seen it and that you felt some connection to it because it does bring out the art as the perfection of a culture or as the epitome of the beauty and the wisdom and the peacefulness and grandeur and celebration of a culture. It's certainly um, one side of a spectrum, possibly, but it's one that is very powerful. So I, I've heard talk about this unconditional expression that comes out of nowhere. And um, I feel like your work really touches on this. And I would love if you have any reflections on the meaning of this or the importance of understanding this kind of expression and relating with it. Okay. Yeah, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> uh, originally, when I worked on uh, in movement, the work I'm doing... Um, Bef sort of before I met uh, the Presencing Institute and the wonderful work that the network of people there is doing, uh, this movement work used to be called The Art of Making a True Move. And I was interested in movement that explored this idea of conditioned, like conditioned behavior, conditioned movement, and what the experience would be to make a gesture or a line of a poem or a mark on the page that was um, coming from a, a, an openness of mind and heart. Can I tell the difference when I make a gesture that's a really uh, authentic or a real true move? And how would I know, <laughs> how would I know that? And, you know, what is genuineness is the question. It could say also, what is um, that kind of spontaneity and freedom and accuracy or um, wholeness? And uh, which I think many people in the arts um, ask in, in various ways and various languages of expressing that. But that sense of not just being um, able to to be more clever or more attractive or more sellable in terms of our of what we make, but also really what is it that could be wakeful in us and and in others uh, in, in, in pr providing something on this planet which is wakeful and and true for for other people and those of us in the performing arts it's it's not something that we can put on the page and, and people look at later, but it's something that's made in the company of others. It could be an audience or it could be co-creators um, of something. And, and certainly an audience is a co-creator as well as the performance side. But 
So collectively, I was interested in how collectively we create wakeful, uh, healthy, up, uplifted, celebratory environments. And it's not necessarily that they're always happy. And sort of the word meaningful sounds too serious and slightly uh, <laughs> heavy laden with something. So I, I, I don't mean, it's not meaningful in that way either, but something that we share collectively as, as communities that could be provoked by this quality of something coming from nothing. It's a simplicity. And certainly the teachings on art that the Trungpa Rinpoche gave were all about this topic. Like, how do you suspend your judgments, opinions, assumptions, beliefs, you know, ideas, likes, dislikes? How do you lighten up on all of the conditions of your life enough to really trust in and uh, fly in, <laughs> in open space? So I think that might be the, a question for many people, uh, certainly many people who make art. I don't know if it is, but um, it has been a leading inquiry in my life, and it remains so, even though the work is now very specifically kind of placed within the frame of social change, which has a, a lot of worldly constrictions, <laughs> the, the thickness of systems and systems that have been psychologically and historically in place for some time. So the, the feeling of intractability, let's say, in the school system uh, and, and, and then this other side of something coming from nothing, how do you bring those two things together? the forms that we have to work with, what we've got to work with every day in our life with people and systems and families and let's say limited resources or the feeling of limited resources, the feeling that of the political climate, the feeling of you know, social structures and social inequalities and distortions and whatever. And also this sense of this very moment, what it is to be free and what it is to love this life and this world so i suppose that's the um the arena that we're making that we're creating and creating society that every moment we create right social fabric social soil is what we sometimes call it in presencing institute and since you're a farmer the importance of good soil if you're going to get plants we're all kind of social soil workers Something about this openness of not knowing and yet the intention of, of using our life to, to make a better world have to come together, those two things. Yeah, big work. Big work, yes. <laughs> so similar to the idea of this structure that we're in, in this mm -hmm. world of, mm -hmm. you know, we have all these things that we're just bound to in a way in terms mm -hmm. of society and what's actually happening in the here and now on earth. <laughs> in our culture and then also the fact that we can you know drop into the present moment and in a, in a way everything is perfect and in a way things can just come out of nowhere and there's all both of those realities exist right mm -hmm. so there's that and then i'm thinking more as a spiritual seeker mm -hmm. the kind of holding space for both or, or living in a body and a mind that both knows that we all have access and we, we are whole enlightened beings mm -hmm. underneath the monk. And yet at the same time, we each have our unique journeys and kind of how can we move through the world knowing that both exist? Mm -hmm. It can be very confusing. What arises is a sense of what is a path. Being in nature could be a path or raising a family could be a path or you know, farming is a path, or cooking a path, or, and then the more formal spiritual paths being um, a practicing um, uh, Christian or a practicing Buddhist. Practicing means that maybe there's a formal meditation discipline, in this case, or formal prayer discipline, or, or yoga discipline, and then there's an application of our understanding about the teachings 
into our life. But it does require some kind of guidance, probably, for many of us. And, who, and maybe that's just an incredible blessing that one finds um, a teacher or teachers along the way of our life who, who really guide us in some way. They point us to um, actual teachings uh, that have been passed down from somebody to somebody. We could be f- f- family teachings or in, in many of our cases, uh, spiritual teachings, but some combination of the actual hearing the teaching and then practicing what practices are that go with those teachings and then, <laughs> and then applying those into you know, how to be a citizen. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine another way. Let's just say it like that. I'm sure there are, there are other ways, but I know that one way would be people and many of us to find some kind of journey and likewise friends that we can journey with because I think a spiritual practice a path is, is really lonely. I, I think if it's not lonely, maybe we we could look look into it a little more or something. But there is something about about a spiritual path which is both lonely and also enormously good container for making friends, real friends. I think that in, in, in the time we live in, the sense of the collective is so important, that collectively we need to join together, collaborate, have conversation, prototype projects that can move forward. It doesn't mean that we give up on our own kind of solitary our own kind of retreat life, our own reflective life, that also has to deepen. So I love this Nicanor Perlas, who's this wonderful man from the Philippines. Um, often I heard him speak, and he used the linescape, the figure eight on its side, and he made this wonderful analogy that if the world will call you to do, to engage, and you have to develop into your spiritual practice and the depth of your understanding an equal amount. And then the world will call you to do more, and it'll be more challenging. And then you have to deepen more d- into your uh, own spiritual strength and understanding, and then the world will call you more. But for many of us, the world calls us and calls us and calls us, and then the time for practice and retreat gets smaller and smaller and smaller on the other side. And we don't feel you know the strength and the the uh, depth of wisdom that we need in order to engage in the challenges that we're being called to face and something like that as a spiritual practitioner is to try to for me anyways to try to remember how important both of these sides of the of life are you know the reflective meditation retreat in a way the kind of loneliness part it's an interesting question. I'm sure we, one that we mature into over the years. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So Arwana, we have come to our time together. And <laughs> once again, I'm so grateful that you've come here. You've, I know your schedule is extremely busy and um, I'm just so happy to have some time with you and happy to share your wisdom with other people so they can be graced by all the beautiful things and the devotion you have to really making this world a better place. Uh, thank you so much. And if anyone wants to find information about Arwana, I'll have it on the podcast information page so you can see all the different ep- events she offers through the years and hopefully go attend one. And her website is arwanahayashi.com. But that will be on it as well. So you, you can take a look. Um, is there anything you want to share to um, anything additional? Just a real appreciation, Olivia, for you asking me to do this. Um, uh, it's always a delight to speak with you, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>